Welcome everyone. Greetings from New York City and Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Stephanie Boyd and I'm very excited to welcome you to our fourth and final webinar that we've been running over the past two days. And a very special shout out to the 2018 Association for Talent Development International Conference and Expo participants in San Diego who are watching this over live stream. Before we begin today's webinar, Culture, Creativity, and the Innovation Imperative with Professor Gita Johar, I want to go over a few brief logistics. First, a recording of this webinar will be available after we conclude. If you're tweeting about the webinar, we encourage you to use the hashtag CBSExecEd. And finally, we encourage you to post questions during the webinar using the Q&A box. We'll answer as many of those questions as possible during the last 10 minutes of the webinar. Gita, it's great to be here with you today. Gita Johar is the Mayor Feldberg Professor of Business in the Marketing Department at Columbia Business School. She's also finishing a three-year stint as the editor of the Journal of Consumer Research. Gita's expertise lies in consumer psychology, focusing on how consumers react to marketing efforts, especially advertising, promotions, and sponsorship. She also examines the influence of consumer self-control and perception of control on decision-making and consumption. Gita, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. So I'm going to talk today about my research as well as other folks' research in the area of uh, innovation and new product development. So the agenda for the day is going to be answering three different questions. The first question is, how, how does one define creativity and why it's important in the world of business? The second uh, question is, what prevents us from being creative, and how can you actually go about becoming more creative? And then I'm going to flip it around and ask the question, what makes consumers accept creativity? So while one can be creative in organizations and creative in branding efforts and advertising efforts, it's also important for consumers to accept this creativity, and that's going to take up a large part of the talk today. Let's start by defining what is creativity and why it's important. So I'm going to show you some images, and one might assume that these images are really creative. So here's one. Probably will come in very handy, but I'm not sure that's very useful. Here's another one, a baby using a onesie that doubles up as a mop. Again, maybe very original and creative, but perhaps not that useful. A fan attached to a pair of chopsticks, cooling your ramen as you eat your noodles. And here's a butter stick. So I think we might all think of these products as being very creative. But I would argue that they're original, but really not that creative. They're also called chindogu in Japan, or unuseless inventions. So what's missing in these products that prevents them from being truly creative? I think the missing component is really about being useful. So creativity is not just about originality, it's also about usefulness. So a definition of creativity that I like is that creativity is a process of developing and expressing novel ideas for solving problems or satisfying needs. This definition is particularly important, I would say, in the world of business. So creative is novel and useful. Let's think about why we care about novelty and usefulness in the world of business. 80% of manufacturing and marketing costs are locked in in the fuzzy front end of new product development. We also know that most new products fail. So anything we could do to improve this front end of the new product development process is going to help us to be successful in the marketplace. In fact, surveys of CEOs across the world reiterate the point that creativity and innovation are really key to managing the complexities and competitiveness of today's business. In fact, firms need to discover more innovative ways of managing their organization's structure, finances, people, as well as strategy. So creativity even goes beyond the new product development process. And yet, when you ask people whether they feel creative, most people tell you, they don't, and they're not really creative. So part of what I want to talk about today is how you can actually go about cultivating creativities. So CEOs don't believe that their organizations are creative, creative, and yet across the world, people are telling us that creativity is the key to driving economic growth. 80% of people all over the world, 85% in the US, 76% in Japan, 
everyone agrees creativity is really important. Yet when you ask the question, are you living up to your creative potential? Most people, again, upwards of 60, 70, 80% of people all over the world tell you that they don't believe they're living up to, your, to their creative potential. So what's really going on here and how does one go about cultivating creativity? So that's what I want to switch to next is this notion of how do we go about becoming more creative? Most of us go around telling ourselves either we are or are not creative people. And we tend to think creativity is a gift or a trait that we either have or don't have. I would argue that much like most other talents in life, nothing is a gift given to us. It's how we work with ourselves and how we develop these gifts that really matters. In fact, if we think about creativity, we can think about a notion where people all are endowed with some level of creativity, but can increase it or decrease it depending on how they respond to everyday events. So perhaps a definition of the traits, the core traits of creativity can help us think through how to better nurture these abilities. So the core traits, that's the curiosity, the C, openness to experience the O, risk tolerance, the R, and energy, the E, those core traits are those that we need to really uh, develop in order to become more creative in our everyday lives. Often what's done is we measure these traits, so we measure a person's curiosity or openness to experience and decide are they or are they not creative. I would flip that around and argue that you need to think through how these traits are defined and then try to cultivate those traits in yourself. Let me start by defining what curiosity is. So curiosity can be defined as a drive or a need or a motivation to know. So for example, some items on this curiosity scale. I enjoy learning about subjects that are unfamiliar. When I see a complicated piece of machinery, I like to ask someone how it works. I find it fascinating to learn new information. All of these questions tap into a trait or a level of curiosity. But I would argue that once we know what it takes to become curious, we can cultivate, cultivate these traits in ourselves. Liking and listening to unusual kinds of music, for example. Let's go to the second trait, openness to experience. Openness to experience can be defined as being imaginative, being independent, and having a pre preference for variety. So how do we develop this trait? Some of the measures of this trait include items such as, I have a very active imagination, aesthetic and artistic concerns are important to me, and without strong emotions, life would be interesting. I think it's interesting to learn, develop new hobbies, and so on. Again, once we understand what it means to, what it means to be open to experiences, we could actually try to cultivate these traits in ourselves. The third um, R of the core traits is risk tolerance or attitudes towards risk. And here it's about how we deal with uncertainty. Admitting that your tastes are different from those of your friends means you're more tolerant of uncertainty and risk and you're not always looking for the sure path. Co-signing a car loan for a friend, driving home after you had three drinks in the last two hours, I'm not so sure about that one, exploring an unknown city or section of town, going on a safari to Kenya, all of these um, things are uncertain, but if you give in to them and go along with them, it's going to increase your risk tolerance. These are examples, of course, but the idea is that you should increase your tolerance for uncertainty. So those are the core traits that determine your level of creativity. I want to now switch around and think about how, as marketers, we can get consumers to be more accepting of creative products and services. So how do you increase acceptance of creative ideas? We all know that there are many, many barriers to adoption, and these are often psychological barriers rather than functional barriers, meaning that a new product might have many, uh, many um, attributes and benefits that a consumer truly values, but whether or not they adopt the new product is a question of how they feel towards the product psychologically. So in my own research, I look at these psychological barriers to adoption. So we know that 40 to 90% across different categories, most new products fail. Here are three spectacular examples. Uh, one, the Segway scooter, which everyone thought would revolutionize the world of transportation, and uh, that didn't really happen. 
uh, web van, maybe a product launched before its time, uh, online deliveries in 2001, and that uh, was a big failure as well, maybe a product that was launched before its time, and Facebook Home, where Facebook thought locking in consumer screens to the Facebook feed would be a good feature that consumers would actually pay for. The um, feature was launched for $99, I believe, and quickly crashed to a price of 99 cents. And here one could argue that Facebook had it wrong, or we could also think about the reasons why consumers didn't want their screens to be locked to the Facebook homepage. And one reason for this could be that consumers want to be in control. They really want to understand um, and know intimately well what's on their phone screen. They want to decide what goes on their home screen and how they can access it. And they don't want Facebook or anyone else telling them what should be on their home screen. So a large part of what determines consumer acceptance to new products is whether consumers feel they are truly in control uh, when they use these products. So let me step back and talk about some qualitative research that's been done looking at how consumers react to smart products. So we hear a lot about products that have um, computer chips or sensors or other uh, AI-related um, technology that enables products to uh, appear to understand and predict consumer tastes and actually act on behalf of the customer. When you think about these products, they seem to really free you up to do your uh, tasks and chores and jobs more efficiently. But at the same time, they might actually make you feel a loss of control. So in this study, the researchers asked uh, consumers in three countries, in China, in Switzerland, and in the US, to imagine a technology that uh, resembled an automatic recommender system. So this technology automatically ordered food for you on the basis of your past patterns of behavior. It detected what kinds of food you liked when you ordered it and automatically ordered this food um, in, uh, without any need for a command uh, from the consumer. So in this study, consumers were asked to think about a product like this and tell the interviewer what came to their minds and how they would react to this product. Here are some quotes. So for example, uh, Yu Chen in China says, I don't want my children to think I am nothing compared to the machine. If this machine could really do a lot of things better than me, then I would just be afraid to be a mum. Yuliang from China says, it's your life, so you need to control your life. Yes, you need to make some decisions. The agent can help you by listing several options that you may prefer, so it's much easier for you to choose. So it helps you make the decision, but does not make the decision for you. Again, there we see this notion of control, the consumer wanting to be in control of their use of the product and not wanting their de decisions to be taken over by the product. Some other quotes from the US. I think it's the disconnection with the producers. So part of going to the farmer's market or a butcher or any of that is interacting with the people whose craft it is to cut up the meat. If you could talk to a farmer, they know exactly, they know if they are good that week. If you come back next week, they will be better, that sort of thing. So here you see this notion of social connectedness, which also may be something that's stripped away when you have these kinds of autonomous or uh, smart products. Some more quotes. I feel like technology dehumanizes the process of consumption and our interaction with food to some capacity in various settings. From Switzerland. I go to a market to buy fresh ingredients. I buy peas, mint, lemons, olives to make it more pleasant. I might buy other stuff. I like to be creative. So again, this fear, fear that your creativity will be taken away, taken away from you and taken over by this new product. And then this uh, fear of being uniform, sameness, and lack of individuality is another fear that prevents us from adopting smart new products. So again, Chun in China says, I think they'll make everyone become the same because we are using the same technology. And maybe it'll become the same food. This food will taste alike, and there's not a lot of diversity. So all of these uh, interviews um, with consumers across China, the US, and Switzerland show these barriers to adoption that are very psychological, that relate to really primal fears that consumers have about these new smart products taking over their lives. 
So going through all of these interviews and focus groups and quotes, these researchers came up with four different barriers to uh, adoption of new products. One is the desire for control. The other is social connectedness. The third one is about wanting experiences or experiential rewards. And the last one is about maintaining your individuality. I'm going to focus on two of these, a desire for control and experiential rewards, and talk about some research that I've done that looks at how these two psychological factors act as a barrier to new product adoption. In terms of desire for control, on the one hand, you can think about these autonomous products or smart products as really helping give you control because they make you more efficient, more effective, and they let you do things that might be truly more important to you. They take away your chores. But on the other hand, you can think about the fact that these chores, these everyday tasks, actually are what make you feel in control of your life. So if you think about the trade-off, sometimes consumers wait the fact that they're losing their control and therefore are afraid to adopt these new products. So what can be done about it? In this research that was uh, done a couple of years ago, what these researchers found is if you design the new product in such a way that it makes you believe you're in control by giving you the option to actually give the command to that autonomous product rather than the autonomous product making decisions on your behalf. So it may not be true control, it's an illusion of control, but even such an illusion of control was found to actually increase adoption intentions for autonomous products. Now, going back to this notion that all of us are different, some of us might already be more open to new products. In that case, this doesn't matter. This notion of empowerment to the consumer doesn't matter. But for a majority of people who may not feel so empowered in their everyday lives, giving them the control to turn off or turn on these features in an autonomous product can actually increase their adoption. In research that I've done, along with my co-authors, Shiri Melamud and Ali Rad, we found a similar notion at play, even for really mundane products. So leave alone the smart products, even in everyday products like potato chips, what we find is people are more likely to stick to the tried and true flavors if they want to have more control over their lives. So um, people high in desire for control were less likely to choose these more um, um, fancy new types of uh, potato chips. We also looked at other product categories like watches in this case, and rather than a design intervention, we thought of a message intervention that could help increase adoption of these types of new products. So in this message, we either told people that this is a new, new approach to time, or we told people, take control of your time. And what we find is people who are high in desire for control are actually able to overcome this desire and adopt new products when they're told that this new product helps them to take control of their time. So you see that in this graph, that actually this control frame helps people to adopt new products. We also did this research in India and China. And across the world, across different cultures, people have different desires for control. So in China, it turns out that um, culturally, the desire for control is lower than in the US and in India. And one can think of many reasons for that, but we find this to be a consistent pattern. And so in India, for example, adoption of new products is likely to be slower than in China. And what we found is if we uh, provide this kind of control taking frame to people in India, it actually helps them to overcome that barrier to new product adoption. And they're more likely to then adopt these new products. And interestingly, this control taking frame does not depress the new product adoption among people who don't have this need for control. So it seems like it could be a win-win solution. Lastly, let me talk about the last factor that could be a barrier for adoption, um, experiential rewards or meaningfulness. So let's think about smart products again. They take away all these mundane uh, chores from our lives, but maybe these very mon mundane aspects of our lives actually also do give our lives meaning. In fact, there's research that suggests that people get meaning from uh, cooking, from cleaning, from taking care of kids. And as you can see in this chat chart, these uh, activities don't make them necessarily happy. And definitely in the moment, cleaning, I don't think would make one happy. 
But what it does is it gives you a sense of accomplishment, which adds to the meaning in your life. And you can see in this um, graph here that the research that we are doing kind of bears out this notion that people don't choose autonomous or smart products if they want meaning in their life. So if you feel lack of meaning in your life, then you're less likely to adopt smart products. We also see this in this graph where people are asked to select either manual cooking tools or the more automated cooking tool. And we find again that people who perceive a lack of meaning in their life are less likely to choose the more autonomous product. Finally, what we find is using either an autonomous product or a more manual product also imparts meaning to your life. So after using these products, we then ask consumers, how much meaning do you perceive in your life, either in your cooking or in your every, um, all, um, everyday life? And once again, we find that people who use the autonomous product or simulate using this autonomous product feel that their life is somehow less meaningful. So to summarize, I think this research shows us that uh, doing these kinds of in-depth interviews and focus groups can really bring about some insights about what are the barriers to new product adoption. We can talk about creativity on the side of the firm, but it's also important to think about how to enable people to be accepting of creativity. And desire for control as well as meaningfulness are two uh, personality variables that I'm very interested in studying from that um, aspect. Now I think uh, I'm open to taking any of your questions. Great, thank you, Professor, for a really thought-provoking presentation. And uh, it's good to know that next time I vacuum, I will be imparting <laughs> meaning into myself. So we've had a couple of questions come through. This one's from Leonardo. Even though CEOs recognize that innovation could unlock revenue potential and aggressive cost reduction, most companies seem to fail to implement a worldwide strong innovation program. What is the biggest barrier to that? So that's a great question. And I think the CEOs that I've talked to, as well as the CMOs, and also all the research shows that there is that recognition, as you suggest. Um, I think it's just hard to drive change in organizations. Uh, I think there's a lot of resistance to programs. So even though you might have a label and a program that's called innovation program, it's not easy to actually use such a program to bring about innovative thinking, because it's very easy for people to fall back into tried and true methods. Um, I think there are techniques one can use, not something I can go into in a quick uh, response to the question, but I think that's a really great uh, observation. Great, and then so along those lines, Sergio asks, um, it's understood that usefulness is important to define creativity, but how does creativity relate to innovation? Yes, that's, that's actually a great point. Um, creativity, I would say, is kind of the heart of innovation. So innovation is the application of creativity. So to me, without creativity, you cannot have innovation. But creativity is not sufficient for innovation. So innovation is more an application of creative thinking and creative ideas. So we have a question also from Melissa talking about age differences. Aren't there generational differences in our approach to automation and technology, i.e. a younger audience may see automation as a time saver and allow them a greater quality of life, whereas the reverse might be true for older generations? That's a really good observation as well. And we did look at that in our data. And we're not finding it so much, but we've just charted on this whole research study where we're looking at uh, automated products. So far, I haven't found consistent differences in terms of age, in terms of whether or not people want to adopt the autonomous products. And desire for control and search for meaning are fairly universal. So. Um, Although I think there are other aspects of autonomous products, like the fact that you're more used to technology and more open to technology, in that sense, younger people might be more open to it. But in terms of meaningfulness and desire for control, I think that's fairly universal. Great. And so we have a couple questions on kind of some emerging trends that we've seen. So this is from Garcia. He notes that self-driving cars could be perceived as dangerous, given that recent accidents and the news about them. Can this early perception be overcome? 
That's really a great point. I think right now that's what we've heard about with the accident with Uber. It is a problem and I think early on, as we've seen with some of these new products that fail, early on if there is a problem, a public perception is set in a certain way and if that's the case then uh, what we're going to find is adoption of this new technology isn't going to be very um, quick to take off. Um, I think it's hard to change people's perceptions of a product once they're set uh, very early on. So I think that's going to be a long process. Great. And another kind of on-trend topic that people think about is mindfulness. And how does that relate to the concept of meaning and some of the issues you've discussed? Yes, so mindfulness is a technique, of course, to create more meaning in your lives, to be in the present, to be very much rooted in the moment. And uh, these um, techniques can increase your perceived meaning, which means you're going to be less likely to be looking for meaning outside of that. So when you feel you have enough control or have enough meaning in your life, then your desire for it gets suppressed, which might mean that you're actually more open to adopting some of these products. Great. So. Switching gears, we have a couple questions that relate to different segments of industry. So Regina asks, do the same concepts, are they applicable to products? The same concepts that are applicable to products, do they also apply to services? Um, I would say so. I haven't really talked about services as much, but the underlying barriers to adoption remain the same. So whether it's giving up control to a product or giving up control to a service, I think you're going to feel the same way if the service or, or the product seems to be taking over aspects of your life. And then also along those lines, to, this is from Jonathan. To what extent do the research findings apply to B2B? Yes, we haven't really looked at B2B as much. Um, I would say that people making decisions in the B2B space are also human beings. So to the extent that they are also subject to the desire for control and to the search for meaning, the decisions uh, would be made in a similar way. Uh, so although we're talking um, you know, decision making that's maybe more formalized and more like a group decision making effort, uh, I would argue you're likely to see aspects of these barriers come up in those situations as well. Great. And then just simply, what can I do to be more creative? Yes, uh, it's a great question. Um, what I like to think about is um, this notion of fixed theories of intelligence and creativity as opposed to what's called more incremental theories. And this takes us back to psychological research that suggests that any of us can actually develop our talents, including intelligence or creativity. And the way to do that is to really think and hold the belief that this talent or the skill can be improved over time. It's not a fixed stock, but it's something that you can work on to actually improve. And so rather than giving up when you can't come up with creative ideas and solutions, to persist and keep trying and coming up with other ways to do things will actually help you to become more creative. And that is something I know I try to do when I hit a brick wall with some of the research that I'm doing. Great. Well, that was a Great final question and um, inspiration for others as they think about their creative path. So thank you, Professor Johar, for a great presentation. And uh, thank you all for your insightful questions. Please give us comments and feedback, and we look forward to hearing from you soon.